our next speaker would be Łukasz Ziobroń. How the journey with the programming for Łukasz started? Well, it started similar, I think, like our most of our journeys with the computer games. When he, have, he was seven, he got his first Amiga. <coughs> and he played so much that he finished all his games which he had. And I would say as a prize, he got his new brand PC. And this is why gaming is good for you and you should always finish all achievements on Steam. <laughs> But for him, that was not enough. Because he was a StarCraft fan, He made a website about this game. And from the website, he went to C++. And after several years, now he's an Nokia employee, and he's not only writing a code, but he's also sharing the knowledge about the code. He's training the Nokia employees and the students of the Wrocław University of Technology and University of Wrocław. But today, Łukasz will share a story. The story about the evolution of C++. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome to the stage, Łukasz Dziobroń. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see you here. Thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Łukasz Ziobroń and I will be talking about revolution of C++. Can you tell me who is a C++ programmer? Please raise your hand up. Almost all the audience. So maybe I should rephrase my question. Who isn't a C++ programmer? No one, no. Can I see one hand? Okay. So I think that you are here because I will convince you that you should change your language to C++. First, I need to tell you something about myself, maybe something more. My adventure with programming started with HTML4. Yeah, I know HTML is not a programming language, but it's a nice start into web development because you can now try PHP. And I made my first website about StarCraft in HTML4, and then I wrote some CMS content management system in PHP. It is so old code, completely unmaintainable, that, but it works for about 10 years, I think, that I have never refactored it, and I will never do it. Uh, later, HTML5 and CCS3 were some kind of new technologies, and I tried them. Uh, and you may think that now the next natural step is JavaScript. Well, now people say that in JavaScript you can do everything, I would argue, but let's do not start, start another flame war. Uh, I choose another path. During my high school, uh, I learned C or C++. I would call it rather C++, because I didn't even know what is the difference between those two languages. And the same was on the first year of my studies. Uh, but during my studies, I learned MATLAB, and I like this language very much, uh, because it has a very nice syntax for matrices and vector operations, and I can recommend it to everyone, but it has one drawback, performance. Um, after my studies, I started my career as a C++ developer. All my studies, I thought that I will go into web development, Well, but there was, there was an open position for a C++ developer. C++ is popular here in Wrocław, so that's why I went into that direction. And in my first work, I met Bartek Szurgot. He is one of the presenters here at CodeDive. And you know, he is such kind of the guy that could find 40 things that could have been done better in my first 30 line code review. Yeah. And Python is my secondary language, and I use it for prototyping things quickly. It's different from C++, but I like this language as well. Okay, so about my another interests. So I keen on archery, but recently I don't have enough time to practice. Uh, I very like digital photography and all the topics areas connected with it, like image processing, 
And if we add machine learning to my interest, there is a nice intro into autonomous cars or artificial intelligence in general. So in general, high-tech high stuff. As you have already heard, I like StarCraft. I played StarCraft 1 a lot, now I play StarCraft 2. And if I have some time, I put some interesting things on my website, on my blog, jobrain.net. Okay, and my presentation has a three key messages, and I want you to remember them, because I will ask you about them later after the talk. First one is C++ had a clear aim which made it popular, to organize code better without the loss of efficiency. Second one, C++ is even more popular now because of new standards, C++ 11 and C++ 14. And the last one, in future, C++ will be one of the most popular programming languages, so it's worth learning. And now I will present you something that argument my thesis, so we will just see if, if that's true or not. Okay, and this is agenda for tomorrow, and we will start with uh, history of C++, which, uh, includes of, uh, which includes C with classes, C front era, and standardization time. After that, we'll go into C++ future, then I will explain you the title of my presentation, which is Revolution of C++, and after that, I will go into thing that is interesting for every programmer, I guess, popularity of programming languages, and summary at the end. Okay, so let's start. Who of you recognize that guy? About half of, the, half of the audience, okay. This is very young and handsome Bjarn Strostrup. He is creator of our language of C++. And you know, while he was writing his PhD thesis, he needed to create some kind of system simulator. And he chose Simula as a language in which he will implement his simulator. And he described his experience with it as a very pleasant because it had all the abstraction he needed. Simula had classes, inheritance, etc., but it had a one drawback, which is performance. He needed something that is very robust, so he decided to rewrite his simulator into C, because C had a nice performance. And his new simulator, of course, had the desired performance, but Mm, Bjorn described writing in C as, uh, well, not so pleasant. So after his PhD, he thought that he can combine the best things from those two languages and create something new. So he took all the abstraction part from Simula and added to C language and created C++. C comes from BCPL, which comes from Assembler. Uh, by the way, do you know what BCPL stands for? Anyone? It's basic combined programming language, but I have heard something better. It's before C programming language, as you can see. <laughs> and C++ is a source for another languages, as you can see, like Java or C Sharp. Okay. And Bjorn Strostrup considered also another languages as a base of C++, but he chose C, and it was a very good choice. I will explain you later what it was a great choice. So first version of C++ was called C with classes, and it was released in 1979. And it was only a C, but with a few additions. And those additions are classes, derived classes, public and private access control. There wasn't protected, protected access control. Constructors and destructors, call and return functions, friend classes, and type checking and conversion of function arguments. You probably don't know what are call and return functions, because they do not exist in uh, C++ nowadays. So, uh, call function is a special member function that was called after uh, any member function was called, uh, except constructor. And return function is also a special member function that was called before calling return statement of every member function. 
but no one except Bjarne used it, so he decided that it can be removed because he can use another techniques to, to do something like that. So let's take a look into example code in C with classes. What is interesting here, in line number six, you have constructor. Yeah, constructor was, uh, has, uh, has a special name, new, and it returned void. Right now, uh, we have another constructor so with a class name, and which returns nothing. Another interesting thing is that uh, member functions need to always be defined elsewhere, and it means that not inside a class body. And another thing, can you see that dot here? Right now we have a scope operator, double columns, but it wasn't available at those times, so there was a dot operator to define a, a scope. Another interesting thing, if you needed to declare some variables of your class, then you needed to write this class keyword explicitly before the type name, like uh, structures in C. Okay, uh, two years later, in 1981, there were some additions to C with classes, which were inline functions, default arguments, and overloading of the assignment operator. I think they are clear for you. I don't need to elaborate on them. And two years later, in 1983, there was something that we can call a first standard library. It contained complex numbers, strings, and later IO streams were added to it. Okay, so this is C with classes. So just to sum it up, Years of development were between 1979 and 1983. IDEA was great because the aim was clear, to help programmers to organize code with classes without the loss of efficiency, but also one very important thing, without requiring from users learning something completely new. That's why he chose C because C, uh, Bjarne chose C because it was very popular programming language and also it allows to, um, for free portability. C could be compiled to very many architectures, very many machines, and thanks to that, C++ uh, is uh, strong in those areas as well. But unfortunately, C with classes didn't have many users, and it wouldn't pay to support this language in the form that Bjorn designed it. So uh, I would call that C with classes was only a medium success. But Bjarne knew about it and drew conclusions because there we have Seafront era. Who of you know what Seafront was? Only a few hands up. Okay, about 10 people. Um, before I will explain you what Seafront was, uh, I need to introduce you into first Bjarne Strostrup book about C++. It was C++ programming language, and his colleague, colleagues from work told him that he should write this book because there was a similar one, the C programming language, and people didn't actually knew how to use C++. So that was the main purpose for him to write a new book, and I can recommend you two ways to learning something new. First one is just play with the language, so change stuff and see what happens. This is my favorite. And another one is just try stuff until they work. First release of C++ was in 1985, but before that, Bjarn decided to change the name of C with classes, and first name was C84. He decided to change the name because people like to shorten things, and after this few years, they started calling C with classes just C and C programmers didn't like it, because how should they name their language? The old C? So he changed the name to C84, but after several months, people dropped off 84, and they were still calling it C. But one of his colleagues told him, uh, he had a great idea just to name it C++, so it means that it's something more than C, and this name was very catchy, quite good, and it exists to mo uh, today. Okay, so Seafront was a first C++ compiler. And in fact, 
it was originally written in CWIF classes, and it wasn't a compiler, whole compiler, it was only a compiler's front end. In fact, it was a transpiler, so it translated C++ into C code. Because portability matters. C++ was very popular, as I told you, and it could be compiled to very many processors, very many architectures. And uh, C++ versions uh, are named after Cfront releases. And the first release was, is, was in 1985. And Cfront 1 had uh, several more features than C with classes. First, very important, is virtual functions. Another one, function name and operator overloading. Then references, constants, new and delete operators, Improved type checking, scope resolution operator, so those two columns, and BCPL style comments terminated by the end of line, so that we use to, uh, today double slash comments. Okay, I think that I need to tell you more about virtual functions. You all know what virtual function is, right? Do you? Okay, and virtual function in C++ 1, <laughs> was, in fact, also abstract function. It couldn't have a body, so virtual keyword meant also abstract. There wasn't equals zero syntax like we have uh, right now. But if it, of course, could be uh, implemented in derived classes. About overloading, uh, overloading should be marked explicitly with the overload keyword. And after, after overload, there was a name of a function, so it meant that uh, function print will be overloaded. Also, about new and delete operators, I, they were controversial because people told him that they do not need them because they can write something like that. Why do we really need this one-liner? We can do something like that. It's redundant. But Bjarne didn't listen to him, and thanks to him, we have uh, the, that nice way of uh, using new and delete, um, and I think this is a great, great idea because it's less error prone. The less you need to type, the less um, errors you introduce into your code. Also about improved type checking, you maybe think that C has a very strict type checking, but in fact, strict type checking in C comes from C++. C++ was first here, uh, and it checked uh, Function calls during compile time. If the argument passed to function are uh, that ones that are really needed, and C++ didn't. So Bjarn needed to preserve backward comp compatibility with C. And he introduced something that we call ellipsis operator. Those three dots, like in printf function. And it means that after that argument, there can be any argument of any type, any number of arguments. And this is now nowadays used in variadic templates. Okay, uh, Cfront had also two minor releases, Cfront 1.1 in 1986 and Cfront 1.2 in 1987. <coughs> At, and it added pointers to members and protected access control. And several bugs were fixed. Okay, and Maybe you can tell me, what features do you expect next after that ones that I presented you? So what could be implemented in Cfront 2? Any ideas from you? Exceptions. Exceptions, that was one idea. Operator. Operators. Operator plus, minus, etc. Operator plus, minus, etc. Any other ideas? Protected access control, it was already. Templates, uh, inheritance, multiple inheritance. Yeah, that one is correct. <laughs> Thank you, you are a very smart guy. Okay, so let me show you what the features were. So in Cfront 2, we had multiple inheritance, type safe linkage, it means name, name mangling, then recursive definition of assignment and initializations. So we could write something like integer a equals b equals c equals 5. And abstract classes, 
from Cfront2, we could differ differentiate <coughs> between virtual and abstract classes, uh, static member functions, const member functions, and overloading of uh, arrow operator that are main features of Cfront2. So I guess that now it will be much easier with Cfront3 because some of the propositions uh, that you mentioned earlier were implemented in Cfront3. Can you name it one again? Multiple inheritance. No, sorry, it was in Cfront2. I have heard something from here. Exceptions. Anything else? Templates, good. Namespaces, templates, nested classes, so you could define uh, one class inside another one, and exceptions. And I need to tell you about exceptions more here, because Cfront3 implemented so-called code approach to exceptions. And code approach is uh, root of all this bad myth about exceptions. So if you have heard that exceptions are evil, that's because people were using Cfront3 probably, or I don't know why they are spreading those rumors. Uh, code approach had runtime overhead, memory overhead, and was taking very large amount of resources. So it wasn't a good approach to exceptions, but if you want to know more, just check out uh, Bartek got presentation, Hello Houston, here you have a link to his presentation. I really recommend you to watch it. The new approach to exceptions is table approach, and it has no time, no runtime overhead if no exception occurred. Also, there is no memory overhead, but we pay for it with increased binary size, and we don't know what is the uh, exception handling time. This is the price that we need to pay for it. But exceptions are not evil, and they are the fastest solution if we need to check for errors. If there is no exception, the code is the fastest as it can be, because if you, let's say, check for error codes, then there are some additional checking of those, uh, of those error codes. Okay, but it was impossible without, co without compiler support. And Bjarne was working on that. He wanted to implement table approach into Cfront. Well, but he didn't manage to do it. It was too much for Cfront. And so, once again, if you want to know more about exceptions, please watch Bartek Surgot's presentation, Hello Houston. So, uh, there was planned release of Cfront number four, and <coughs> what the only feature was stable approach to exceptions, but unfortunately, Cfront died in that battle. So, just to sum it up, years of development of Cfront were between 1985 and 1993, Cfront was a compiler's front-end, and it translated C++ into C because of free portability. And what is very, very nice is the explosion of interest in those years. So commercial release was, is, was in 1985, and number of users increased from 500 in that year up to 1.5 million in 1993 it means that it was exponential growth. So many new features were added to C++, but as I told you, that new approach to exceptions was impossible to be added. And now it's time for standardization. Standardization of C++ started in 1989, but probably you know when was the first ISO CPP standard of C++. What, in what, what version of C++ was first? Yep, 98. So after nine years, we had the first, work, you know, first uh, C++ standard. By the way, this image resembles me, our education system. The features were, there are only uh, the major features, I think. Uh, RTTI, so real-time type information, cast operators, mutable, bool, declarations in conditions, because um, in C you couldn't declare a variable in if or in a for loop, it should be declared just before, before them. Um, also, member templates, well, we had only class templates so far, so member template functions were added, and export keyword, 
and all the library that you mentioned, a library stuff. But uh, I will not be talking about library because uh, I don't have enough time for it. So just in generally about uh, C++ 98 library, we had containers, algorithms, iterators. I think they are the most important things. Then auto pointers, some strings, IO streams, complex numbers, and some minor additions. Okay, and there was also a release in 2003, but it was a minor release, so-called bug fix release. And it didn't add any new feature to C++, I guess, but it fixed about 125 bugs, including bug number 69, because STD vector could be incontiguous. So, thanks God, it was, uh, it was fixed. And then we have a C++ 11. Even Bjarne Strostrup told that C++ 11 feels like a new language. I don't, know, I don't know if you know, but code name of C++ 11 was C++0x. It was because standardization committee thought that it will be ready at least in 2009. But, mm, you know, engineers are very smart guys and everything works because if you substitute B for X, then we have 11, not a problem. Okay. So what are new features in C++11? I guess it should be really easy. Uh, maybe before you answer that question, who do not use modern C++, so C++11? Who use older version of C++? Mm, very small hands, about 10 people, I guess. And why? This is my question. Okay, compiler doesn't support it. Probably you need to do some embedded stuff. Okay. Uh, so, who uses modern C++? Okay, as I expected. Thank you. So, what are new features in C++11? Shared pointers. Yeah, smart pointers in general. Auto. Air value references. Lambdas. Move semantics. What else? Variadic templates, <laughs> const expressions, threads, so multi-threading, attributes. Okay, so this was really easy. Thank you. So this is a list of features, not complete. You have mentioned almost everything. Oh, I guess you haven't mentioned about default, delete, final, and override keywords, uh, about move semantics, scoped enums. I have heard const expressions. A uniform initialization, delegating constructors, null pointer, okay, type aliases and smart pointers were mentioned, and another page, variadic templates, uh, literals, attributes, lambda expressions, no accept keyword, align as, align off, multi-threading, range-based for, and static assertions. I will not talk about additions to standard library because there were so many things added. And C++14. <laughs> I haven't even asked for that. You don't need to name them, but please ask me, ask a question who uses C++14, not 11. Not so many people as I expected, only about, I don't know, 20 people here. So. I guess you should migrate into C++ because the next version will be in next year. <coughs> okay, and new features in C++14 are like this. So we can have now generic lambdas. So the lambda can automatically deduce the types that you passed to it. And lambda capture expressions where we can just, uh, let's say, move a unique pointer into lambda we needed to do a, some kind of hack in C++11 to do that. We have function return type deduction, so we can use auto as a uh, return type from functions. Um, alternate type deduction declaration, relaxed restrictions on const exp functions, so from C++14, const exp are really useful. In C++11, there were so much restrictions that it wasn't, uh, I think, uh, it wasn't uh, convenient to use them. Also, we have variable templates, binary literals, 
digit separators and deprecated attribute was added into C++14. Okay, so just to sum it up, standardization of C++ started in 1989 and first standard was available nine years later in 1998. And the next version of C++ were C++03, C++11, and C++14. Do you agree? Or do you think that I skipped something here? Yeah, technical reports, thank you. You know, every bigger company needed to have its own compiler because every company needed different features. So during that standardization time, we had, uh, earlier we had explosion of interest and now every company was trying to use C++ because it was popular and it had a nice performance. And everyone wanted different features. That's why standardization started. Because if you have some code in C++, you want to exchange compiler and compile it in using something uh, different. And r right now, only three compilers fully support C++14. Can you name them? GCC, CLANG, and MSVC. I wasn't sure about MSVC, but I needed to check. Uh, according to that list, uh, it is compliant with C++14. But I wasn't sure. Okay. And number of users were oscillating about 3 million. This is data from mm, Bjarne Strostrup. Okay, now it's time for C++ future. The main features that I have here are like this. So it's file system technical specification, parallelism TS, library fundamentals TS, if const expressions, uh, auto in templates, structured bindings. This is a really nice feature because now you will be able to return multiple values from functions like in Python or another programming languages. Also, if and switch with initializers. Also many, many more, but we still don't know what will be finally in C++17. So that's why I didn't put anything more here. But uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, Michael's Wong keynote today, C++17, will it be great or just okay? But if not, please watch it on YouTube later because he explained it, uh, what, what is the status of features of C++17. You also need to know that there were very many features that were planned for C++17, but they are out of scope because backward compatibility hampers the standardization of new standards. There is much more features right now, so adding anything new needs to, well, we need to just check if it will not break any of the existing ones, like with every software that you need to write, I guess. And I found a very nice feature of, a uh, very nice list of C++17 features on Stack Overflow. Here you have a link, you can check it after my presentation. Okay, the next version, planet version, is C++20, because standardization committee plans to release C++ in a three year cycle. This will be a minor release, and we still don't know what the features will be but probably something that is out of scope right now of C++17 and maybe some fixes to C++17. Okay, so just to sum it up, C++17 is almost ready and future versions will be released every three years and next planned version is C++20, which will be minor. C++17 is a major version of C++. Okay, and backward compatibility, as I told you, hamper the standardization of new features. And right now, if you want to check out some of C++17 features, you can try it using GCC or CLANG, because they already implement some of the features. Also, MSVC has some features, but it's a way behind those two. Uh, as you know, um, CLANG and GCC have open source, so uh, many people contribute to them, and that's why we have uh, all the features ready. I guess they will be fully supporting C++17 between the standard will be fully ratified by all of the people who need to ratify it. Okay, 
I think it's now time to explain you the title of my presentation. And I guess that all of you know that evolution means slow changes over some long period of time, and revolution means uh, rapid changes over quite short period of time. And taking C++ into consideration, we can think that it had uh, times where it was an evolution of the language and revolution. For example, revolution is right now. Everything will be... I don't know if you noticed that, but the development of language is now very rapid. All the compilers try to implement the standard as fast as possible. And something similar was when Bjarne was working on Seafront. The number of users grow from 500 to 1.5 million in uh, six years, I guess, or even less. Uh, and standardization committee could break uh, very, very many things in C++, but I think that everything went in the right direction, and C++ evolved in a very nice way, and I really like this language. Uh, but some people say that C++ is becoming more and more complicated. Even Bjarne Strostrup said that I have always wished for my computer to be as easy to use as my telephone, and my wish has come true because I can no longer figure out how to use my telephone. I have some images that can help you understand that. Uh, people say that our standard library is poor, but language is complicated. Well, let's take a look. Uh, there is a graphical representation of how many features we have we had in C++ 98 and how many are in C++ 11 and the same about standard library. So language part and library part has grown a little bit, but when we compare C++ to another languages, well, language part for C++ 11 and Java 7 and C Sharp 3 is almost in the same size, but to compare library, we need to change scale. So as you see, our standard library is really poor when we compare it to another programming languages. By the way, this image comes from Herb Sutter presentation 1C++. If you haven't watched it, I recommend it. Um, but you know, uh, our standard library will grow, but we don't know to have something that is in JavaScript or JavaScript. I don't know if you have any fellow JavaScript programmers. I have a few, and every time I met them, once a week or once a month, they told me how, new, how interesting new framework they, all, they have just learned. And this is every week, but about just another framework. I don't know how many things are changing in JavaScript, but there is still something new and new, and I cannot catch up with that. Also, nowadays, people actually don't know how to learn C++. Probably you were taught, uh, you learned C++ in that way, that first you learned C, and then you are trying to move towards C++. So what are the features? I guess everyone, will, everyone was struggling with pointers, and it was the main reason why some people don't like C++. But if you are after that part, then everything is easy, until you meet uh, templates. And I recommend you Kate Gregory. Um, she had a nice presentation on, on CPPCon one year ago, uh, Stop Teaching C. And she tells how should you teach people C++ right now. Do not start with C just because you were taught like, like that. This is an in interesting thing that I wanted to show you. When we had first implementation of C++ standards, uh, C84 didn't have any official standard, but Bjarn wrote a book called The Arm, the Annotated Reference Manual, and it was in 1989. But like a documentation, if you write it to the existing code, it almost never uh, is uh, compliant with that, because you simply do not remember what is in the code. So we cannot say that uh, Standard, uh, was this standard was implemented. 
but for C++ 98, first implementation was done in 2003, first complete implementation. And it was done by two companies, the Edison Design Group and Dincomware. Uh, I don't know what is with C++ 03. I couldn't find any information, but I would guess that maybe GCC was first that fully implemented the standard. Uh, and interesting part is here. We have C++ 11, and the first implementation, full implementation of C++ 11 was in 2013. It was done by CLANG 3.3, and only a few months later, it was still 2013, CLANG implemented C++ 14. Amazing. Probably we will have something similar with C++ 17. I guess the implementation will be ready before the standard will be fully accepted. Yeah, you can ask me how is it possible? Uh, well, many people, uh, I guess that Michael Wong already answered that question, because many people who are working on that standard are already engaged in a compiler's implementation, so they know what will be in those standards. Also, uh, draft of standard will be available just before it will be fully accepted, so everyone can read that. And interesting is that uh, draft of standard is free of charge, but to buy a full standard you need to pay, I don't know, uh, several dollars for it. Um, okay. I don't know if you have watched another presentation, Free Lunch is Over, uh, or I guess it wasn't a presentation, it was only a publication. Uh, you can find it on Herb Sutter website, this is a link for it, and you need to remember one thing, that Free Lunch is Over, and Free Lunch is something that was between 1975 and 2005. You could always, in that time, write some application that was not working maybe uh, fast, let's say, but you can, of course, wait a few years or maybe months when there will be a better processor with a greater speed and your application will be fast on it. Right now, uh, Moore's law is not applicable any uh, anymore. Moore's law was about a processor speed or computer power that it doubles every 18 months, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and Processor speed doesn't rise, and we must now go into concurrency. And we must need to know how to write multi-threaded apps, and we must write effective and efficient code. I guess all of you has your Android phones in your pockets or iPhones, and do you know it? what language right now do we write application on mobile devices? Java. Uh, it was something like that, but I don't know if still Java is the most popular. All the games that you have in your Android phones are probably written in C++. Maybe not directly in C++, but some, there are some frameworks that translate your code into C++. Because now, battery matters. Everything needs to be very, uh, very efficient. And if your mobile applications are efficient, they save your battery. That's why C++ is still on hype again. And modern C++ facilitate all the above needs. So it's really worth learning. I don't know if you have read that book. It's Effective Modern C++ by Scott Myers. This book cover is real. I know that you have seen something that I, are not real earlier in my presentation. But this one is real. I really recommend you that book. And some people may say that virtual machine languages are also good, but as I told you, they will not be faster than C++. There is always some overhead of those virtual machines or of garbage collection, I don't know. Uh, and nowadays, as I told you, more and more mobile applications are written in C++. Uh, you can also think that C is a good choice here. Uh, if you think that it will be faster than C++, then please watch Bartek Surgot presentation, C++ versus C, the embedded perspective from Code Dive one year ago. Uh, maybe C can perform better, but uh, not in every cases, and uh, it doesn't have all the abstractions that we have in C++. Okay, so now I think it's time for something you are 
waiting for, popularity of programming languages. What is your guess? What is the most popular programming language nowadays? C? Java. Java. Any guesses? JavaScript. How do we measure JavaScript. Exactly. How do we measure it? That's the proper answer. It depends. It's the universal answer to every programming language. <laughs> you should know that. It depends how do we measure it. I wanted to see you the number of C++ users across some years. And uh, everything started with one man, Bjarne Stroustrup, in 1979. And his colleagues joined into development of that language. And they also used it to implement some things, I don't know. Uh, but the first uh, commercial release was in 1985. And then C++ was used across universities and some companies started using it, like HP, IBM, Hall, AT&T, or DEC, they were very popular companies. Borland was one, one of the biggest companies that used C++ and had the most popular C++ compiler. But now, Borland C++ compiler is dead, it's no longer supported. Um, do you remember Borland C++ compiler? Yeah, you do. I learned C++ on Borland C++ Borland compiler. And later, as you know, Microsoft and Apple are a big players in the game about C++. Now, Google and Facebook. And I think this is the more interesting because it's a nice graphical overview. How does it look like? So, commercial release was here in 1985, and the number of users grown exponentially here. Standardization started in 1989, and first CPP standard was here. And we can see that right now the number of users didn't grow anymore, or maybe not in, in that pace, because there is even a so slowdown or, or regression on that. I don't know what is the reason, but I have my own theory. Many new programming languages were released during uh, that years, and people just tried something, something new. Processors were very fast, and there were many modern programming languages. But uh, here we have something that we can call mobile revolution. There are more and more mobile devices, ARM processors, and we, from that we really need a really good performance. And that's why C++, once again, is on hype and according to new standards, number of users, uh, we have more users and we can write that application in a, in a way that is desired. Uh, this image comes from Bjarne Stroustrup keynote from CppCon 2016. Here you have a link to, to that video. I recommend you watching it as well. And let me present you now some data about uh, language popularity. The first one is Tiobe index. Tiobe is uh, present you how what is the market share of um, some languages, and this index is built on search engines. It simply tells you how many websites about those programming language are available online. And this is the graph. C++ is green. And we have data from 2001 up to now. And according to it, C++ is on a third place. We can see that there are some new languages here. The first one is Java, according to, to that. So we have many pages with Java. And C is on a second place, but I, you can see a very big uh, regression here, very big decline. C++ is on a third place. I guess that it's better to compare it in, uh, in that table. Uh, one year ago, in October 2015, we, all, we were on a third place as well. And the change wasn't big. We are still on a third place with about 5.8% market share, percent market share. Also, there is a Java and C before us and after us we have 
C Sharp, Python, JavaScript. Then PHD, there is even Visual Basic, Perl, and Objective C. Okay, another index, PIPL, Popularity of Programming Languages. This index is based on Google Trends, so it do not tell you how many web pages about that languages are in the internet, but uh, what are people asking for, what they are looking for in the internet. So this data comes from Google only, and their search engine. So what do people search in internet? And they are checking phrase language tutorials, like C++ tutorials or Java tutorials. This is the data. And C++ is um, that bold line. And you can see that, uh, well, not so many people are lo looking for C++ on the web right now. Um, maybe right now it will be more readable. Interesting thing is that Java is almost, has almost the same popularity over those years from 2005 up to now. And Python is, popularity of Python is still rising. It's this red, red line here. C++ has a slightly declining popularity according to that index. And once again, just take a look in the table. Uh, comparing to a year ago in October 2015 and October 2016, we had a slight decline. Uh, we have now 6.9% percent of market share. Another one, Code Evil. I don't know if you know Code Evil. Uh, it's a web service where which has some programming challenges. And they have very many, very various programming challenges. And they have their blog and they published the data in which languages people submit the submissions of programming challenges. This is the data from October 2016. And we can see that Python is the most popular according to them, then Java, and C++ with almost 10%. Then we have C Sharp, C, JavaScript, Ruby, and another minor languages. If we want to compare it with a year ago, it's almost the same. Still, Python was first, Java, and then C++. We have even the same, let's say, share. It was 9.9% now, and a year ago, 9.8%. <coughs> you see that Python it doesn't have so much uh, usage, a uh, number of users, quite similar to Java. And the rest of languages uh, has slightly changed. I don't know. Uh, this is the most interesting index, at least for me. You all know GitHub, and you all know Stack Overflow, I guess, right? And Corriger Index is based on those two services. This is the web page, and you can compare languages according to how many lines of in, that, in that language were changed on GitHub, and how many posts on Stack Overflow tagged with uh, that language are there. So this is the data. On the x-axis, here we have GitHub, how many lines are changed, and there is one billion lines here. On the y-axis, we have Stack Overflow tags, and there is one million tags here. So this is not important uh, where exactly we are. I wanted to show you that we are here. So C++, as well as other languages like JavaScript, PHP, Java, C Sharp, Python, and HTML, which is not programming language, has the, is the most popular. Uh, if we take only GitHub into consideration, we are on a fifth place. If we take Stack Overflow into consideration, we are on seventh place. So not so bad, I guess. Okay. And about Stack Overflow, you all use Stack Overflow, right? You know that good programmer is a lazy programmer, but if you are lazy, it doesn't mean that you are a good programmer. There is even a book, Copying and Pasting from Stack Overflow. It's a real book. 
It has only 10 pages. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, in a paper form, only in electronic, but you can Google for it. Yep. But good programmers do not like to reinvent the wheel, and they prefer to do job once and never come back. So they write a good code, and, and that's it. According to the data that I presented, C++ is not that. Number of users, according to Bjarne Strostrup, is still rising. And in the worst case, we were on a seventh place. In the best case, we were on a third place. So C++ is one of the most popular programming languages. But do not forget that there will be next releases of C++. So I guess it will be even more popular. You know what is happening to C++ right now. OK. Uh, and one more thing that Bjarne said about C++, how future C++ will look like. So he want that kind of features that, it, that uh, will make C++ type and resource safe. It will have sim significantly simpler and clearer code, as fast or faster than anything else. And this is a very good point. Good at using modern har hardware. More pipelines, more concurrency, and significantly faster compilation, catching many more errors. I don't, don't know if this is able to achieve all of that goals, but this is beyond a wish. And I hope that uh, revolution or evolution of C++ will go into that direction. OK, I guess it's time for a summary right now. So, do you remember my key messages? First one was that C++ had a clear aim which made it popular, to organize code better without the loss of efficiency. Second one was that C++ is even more popular right now because of new standards, C++ 11 and C++ 14. C++ will be one of the most popular programming languages. Yep, so it's worth learning. I don't know if I convinced you, I hope I do, but what else you can do right now? I can recommend you some things to read or watch. Uh, Bjarne Strostrup keynote, the evolution of C++, past, present, and future. Uh, it was presented on CppCon 2016, about a month or two ago, and you may think that the title is quite similar to mine, but I didn't stole it from Bjarn where I submitted my paper to CodeDive, I already chose my topic, and then I saw that Bjarn had the same topic on CppCon. He stole it from mine, right, from me, right. Uh, Bjarn's talk is more philosophical, mine is more focused on features which were added in which version of C++. So if you want a complete uh, image, I recommend you to watch it. He tells a lot about future of C++. Uh, another one is Herb Sutter, 1C++ from Going Native 2013. And I can recommend you as well Craig Gregory, uh, Kate Gregory, Stop Teaching C from CppCon 2015. It's a lighting talk, only 15 minutes, but change your mind on how C++ should be mm, teached right now and how you were teached C++. Uh, if, you know, if you want to know more about history of C++, then please read Bjarne Strostrup paper, A History of C++ from 1979 to 1991. My presentation is mainly based on that paper. And I, something that I recommend to everyone, Effective Modern C++ by Bjarne Strostrup. Uh, sorry, by Scott Myers, of course. Okay. So can you tell me, I don't know if you were counting, how many book covers were in my presentation? Six, eight. Six, eight. Any guesses? Five, two. <laughs> Who told seven? One. It depends. <laughs> it depends, right. <laughs> you are learning quickly. Who told eight? Yeah, it was eight. These are the book covers that are in my presentation. And which one are real? Do you remember? Effective modern C++, is it real? 
Yes, it is. <laughs> the last three are real. What you should do now, I guess that you should be looking forward to C++ 17 and learn it. If you still don't use modern C++, you should really do it. And you should also watch a lot of videos from C++ conferences. I don't know if you do that, but I do if I have time. And also visit CPP, isocpp.org just to catch up with all the things that are happening with C++ right now. And I wanted to end my presentation with a very famous quotation. Learn C++, it's an investment. Do you know who have said these words? Strostrup? No, it wasn't Strostrup. Myers? No, it wasn't Myers. Me? How do you know? <laughs> well, I guess that someone must have said these words before me, but let me put my name under it. Thank you. Uh, you talk uh, about this uh, very poor standard library in comparison with the, uh, mm -hmm. such languages as Java and .NET. And I would like to ask you, do you think, uh, if you think that is a pro could be a problem? Because uh, according to me, uh, based on my experience, it makes that a lot of things which are uh, easier accessible in Java or C Sharp, uh, in C++ you have to make uh, by your own. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, do you think that in some area, uh, the new language Go can be a little bit more efficient and can, and can take a little bit market uh, from C++? Okay, so the first question was if I think that uh, our poor C++ standard library is uh, an advantage or disadvantage of C++. Well, I think that it's an advantage because we don't have to know all of that thing. We have one source uh, like CPP reference or C++.com, what do you prefer? And uh, there aren't so many stuff, but I guess that it is as efficient as possible. And another libraries, if there is more stuff, then probably language will grow, compile, I don't know what about uh, compilation. If you will need to include all of those stuff, it for, for sure speed of compilation will not be as good as, uh, as you probably want. Uh, so for me, it's an advantage. If I need something more, then I will look for an, any external library. Uh, we have Boost, which is, well, let's say, a candidate for a standard library. Uh, and uh, if new features are added in new versions, they are mainly taken from Boost. Uh, so for me, it's an advantage. Does it answer your question? Okay, and the second question was about language Go. To be honest, I don't know Go, so I cannot answer that question. Okay, so I don't know if uh, it will be a better language than C++ or not. Uh, do you have some predictions about the future of C++? Do I have some predictions about the future of C++? Hmm. Well, I would really like to see everything that Bjarn Strostrup said uh, that I presented you in one of the last slides, those. So, uh, about predictions. Well, I guess that standardization committee has uh, really a lot of work to do, and I would be glad to see the f all the features that they planned. But from my experience, uh, maybe not experience, from what I have seen so far, uh, many features will be out of the scope because uh, they need to take into consideration all the existing features. Do not to break anything uh, that is currently in our language. I don't know if you know Python. In Python 3, there was a break in backward compatibility. Python 3 is not comp compatible with Python 2. And, uh, well, Python 3 do not have so many users because still many libraries are written in Python 2 and people don't want to change their language version. I hope that in C++ they will not break backward compatibility. But uh, as you see, uh, this is the main reason why standardization isn't as fast as it could be. So I hope to see all of that features. And my prediction is that we will have them maybe in 10 years. 
Does it answer so your question? One more question. Yep. Uh, what what are the languages that uh, C++ now follows? I think some I I've heard that some uh, uh, features from, for example, Python uh, will be in C++ 17. Uh, uh, you mean structured binding? The yes, question was like uh, what another languages does C++ follow right now? Uh, I think that C++ do not follow any. <laughs> programming language. Even Björn Strostrup told on his keynote that uh, we shouldn't look at another languages. C++ is exceptional language and we have our own rules so we should know uh, what we should do. Uh, we just need to listen to our users what they want to see, check out all the papers that are incoming to standardization committee and vote for them which will be the most useful uh, which will not be useful. So this is the way C++ follows. They are not looking on another languages. Maybe if there are some users that has some nice experience with another programming languages, they propose something to be also in C++, but they are unrelated, I guess. What uh, kind of features would you like want to see in C++ 20? Something, something particular that didn't make it to C++ 17? Well, what kind of features I w would like to see in C++20? Um, I guess that uh, this technical specification which are under development right now are the things that I, I would like to see. Uh, one of them is contracts. I like contract programming. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows here what is contract programming, but uh, it's a general concept that uh, on the interfaces, you should have some kind of contract. So if you are calling some function from interface, there is a contract. What should you provide uh, to have the correct results? Uh, and uh, that kind of things uh, I would like to see. And another one, I guess, concepts, because they are connected with um, metaprogramming and they will simplify it a lot, I guess. There was a huge gap between standards 0, 3, and 11, yeah, that's a lot of time. Not much was happening, the user base was declining. Uh, do you know what made the committee change their mind and st start including new features? Because I read a book by Biani before, and mm -hmm. I guess it was his, uh, by default he was rejecting new features. What made them change their mind, or what made them change the attitude? Okay, so the question was... start accepting uh, new features? And okay, there was a big gap between C++03 and C++11, and a number of users were declining, and Bjarne was blocking development of some features and why he changed his mind, right? Uh, well, I don't know if Bjarne blocked some of some features. Maybe uh, these were the features that he... that uh, I don't know... Uh, worse than the performance of C++. He wants, he had a clear aim, and this is here. He wants C++ to be as fast as possible, and uh, all of all of that stuff. So if he he isn't the only guy who vote for the features, so it's whole standardization committee, and it took them so much time to standardize new features. Uh, I guess because of this backward compatibility. And C++ uh, is right now more popular because of mobile phones. And I guess that's why now we have a really fast, wo fast going works on the new standards of C++. Because we really lack of some features that will be uh, really nice, uh, especially for concurrency. Uh, but going back to your question, I don't know uh, which features Bjarn has blocked and I don't know so I cannot answer that, that part. I would like to ask the question about the networking in standard library. Uh, do you think it will be uh, supported in the near future to have the one standard uh, function, the one standard library, uh, instead of using uh, frameworks for that? Mm, the question was about networking library and... Uh... Uh, implementation in standard library. So uh, we have uh, all the uh, features in uh, one place. 
uh, in standard library, not using the uh, big uh, frameworks. So we that should have all the features in standard library without including any other frameworks, right? About the networking. Networking stuff. Um, I don't know how it will be implemented. I haven't seen it, to be honest. So I don't know how it will look like. I guess that you will only need to include that networking library and there, it's everything that so, you need. Uh, I mean, uh, it will be uh, included or um, I heard that will be a future a feature in uh, next uh, releases, but uh, currently you have to use uh, big uh, frameworks like Qt. Okay, so uh, you are working about current version of C++. Yes. In, in C++ 14, uh, yes, you need to include uh, additional libraries, and in C++ 17 as well, because uh, networking uh, technical specification is out of scope, but uh, uh, I guess it should be in C++ 20. So uh, you need to wait until C++ 20, I hope, uh, to include only one library for networking, and until that time you really need to use whatever you want right now, whatever you use. Do you think that given added new feature to the C++, uh, follow us to become our standard library as big as in the other languages, like in Java, C Sharp, or so other? And because very often, especially in the projects which are realized for a long time, uh, we have completely different standards in some parts of code. Uh, since uh, C98, uh, uh, until C++ uh, 13. And this makes some problems, especially for, this make a problems in developing and uh, in maintenance of the code. Okay, the question was uh, with C++ library, if it will grow like in another languages that I presented, like Java or C Sharp. Well, I don't think so. Maybe not as big. There will be, uh, n not so big, I guess. Uh, not as big as in Java, not as big in C Sharp, uh, only a bit bigger. Uh, you know that uh, I will refer uh, to Michael Michael's Wong presentation. I don't know if you have attended it uh, today. He was presenting how many pages of standards are right now, uh, and it's I guess about one uh, and half thousand in C++ 17, something like that, and we had 1,300 pages in C++ 14. So I expect a proportional growth in the C++ library. Uh, there was uh, also another part of question that you have a different version of C++ uh, in your project, uh, and uh, if, is, is there any cure for that? Uh, I guess it depends on your compiler. Uh, it depends on compiler's flag, because older code should compile in modern C++, but uh, you know that uh, older code uh, maybe in some places used some undefined behavior or some things that were not specified earlier, so you need to correct them. But I guess it's not so hard to move toward a modern C++. Uh, you only need some, mm, some effort from you. It depends on how big was the project. Uh, and it is really important to fix those errors that you have that do not allow you to compile in, uh, in modern C++, because uh, modern compilers do a lot of work for you. You don't have to worry about, uh, I don't know, uh, about some kinds of uh, errors in your code or undefined behavior. Modern compilers even tells you what, if you have a mistake in your code, uh, what should, what probably you meant, how you should change them. Uh, but there is, of course, some effort. I don't know if there is any cure. Just try to compile it with uh, all the flags, very strict flags, that, mm, that will make it, uh, that you can uh, just see how many errors are there and try fix them. That's all. I don't know if there is any better way. Okay, uh, there is a hint. Uh, there is cl Clank Tidy and Clank Modernizer. Yeah, I haven't used them, uh, but uh, you can talk to Bartek, who suggested those, uh, those tools, and maybe they can help you. Bye. Thank you once again.